Okay. All right. Hello, everybody. Michael and I are back uh, doing a video together. And today we're going to talk about how we identify the creepy part of the paranormal um, to different things. And I had done an article for Paranorm Paranormal Underground. And usually whenever I do a article, I read it to Michael first before I send it off to see what he thinks. And he kind of liked it. And so Michael said, well, Rainbow, where'd you get the idea for this? And I said, well, it's just like all this crazy, creepy stuff is happening. Um, Slender Man, uh, those white looking rake type entities, um, black eyed kids, uh, and other things that uh, I've noticed that have come up within the past 15 to 20 years. And so we thought we would talk about that today. Yeah. Uh, so one of the things, um, that uh, probably for over you know 20 years or so, uh, I was kind of involved with was the Black Eyed Children movement, and uh, which was sort of like came through some of the children in the corn scuff uh, that was on movies. Oh yeah, children, children in the corn. Right. Yeah. yeah. So, anyways, so it was we didn't quite know, or I didn't feel at the time that I really knew. Was this a phenomenon or is it something that was created in people's minds? Uh, David Weatherly did a wonderful book called Black Eyed Children uh, that I recommend that uh, you read. It's re really great. It's some wonderful stories in there about encounters, pretty scary encounters. It isn't that these are wonderful little children coming to your door. Uh, it's pretty, pretty traumatic for many people, especially people that don't understand it or get it and suddenly these children appear. And we even talked about it that a lot of people who experience the black eyed children are very, uh, I don't say ignorant, but they don't know, they're innocent. They don't, don't know anything about them. And it seems like these children know that they don't know anything. Right, it seems like they, yeah. they kind of target. It seems like there's quite yes. a few elderly people, uh, not exclusive, but elderly people seem to, to have encounters. Children have encounters too. Yeah, children will have encounters that if they're with their parents or something. Or without they'll, parents, too. And it, they'll come to the door and they try to communicate with the children, etc. And they say, will, will you let us come in and play? And the weird thing about the Black Eyed Kids is that you have to be, in, they have to be invited in. And so I kind of compared them to vampires because vampires have to be invited in. And right. I don't know what that threshold is that keeps them out. But once you say, yes, come in. Like if a couple say, oh, if, if a child goes up to the door and says, oh, I'm lost, or can I call my mommy, or can, can I use your phone, I need the bathroom, and it's 11, 12, 12 o'clock at night, yeah, right. most people go, oh, God, you poor child, and they'll let them in, and then that's when they get you. Right. Well, that's what we know. I mean, we, we think that happens. One of the things that even Dev David Weatherly has said that they really don't know what happens when the when somebody comes in the house when they actually, actually come in? There are stories that they do know. Oh, they um, do. Okay. Go, there us. is there was an older couple that let two children in, and it just happened to be just one of those situations where the couple was like, "Oh my God, there's kids. Let's let them in." And I don't think it was too late at night. It was probably around ten o'clock. But what I understand is that they let the kids in, and then all of a sudden. They, they had missing time. They didn't remember what had happened. And after these kids visit people, from what the few, the few stories that I have found on the internet, they get sick. And, right. and the, the children get sick. Um, if they let them in the car to play, uh, they, they, in fact, I don't, I think um, David might have had a story in his book about a child that let one of the black eyed children in the car. And then the father, um, it, the, how the story goes, that the mother was so freaked out by seeing this child with black eyes that she uh, uh, ran back into the store and um, called her husband. And then what happened is that when he came to, uh, uh, to the store and she was telling him what had happened, he said, well, honey, I'll drive this car, you drive my car. And when he drove home, he got into an accident. So like, uh, some type of really horrible situation befalls people that these kids encounter, as well as their health. 
Right. Not only their health, but I also heard animals. Animals, had, animals had, die. If you had dogs in your house or something, and after this encounter, they could either get violently ill or they die. Um, right. I, and, and just so uh, this is something I just found out that cats, as you can see, this is Beepo, our cat, our coon cat. Um, cats are fantastic because they don't seem to shy away from the black eyed kids. They'll hiss and they'll, you know, they'll make noises. But there's been a few instances where cats have actually saved people from letting them in. The cat is, is phenomenal in many ways. They can see into the ethereal world, but they are not afraid of these things. And even though they won't go near them, but they will hiss and do the warning for the humans. Right, right. So let, let me tell you a little bit about a, not an experience that we had here in Oregon, but it was, uh, I was looking at a website. We have this website, you, everybody has it. I believe it's called Next Door Neighbor. And it's kind of a neighborhood type thing. And, and when things are happening, people will post some things on there. Well, anyways, there was, um, I'm gonna say it was probably a year ago or so by now. Anyways, there was people talking about these kids that were coming late at night. Um, and it was like kind of an older uh, child, like a teenager and a couple littler kids. And they were coming to doors and they were trying to get in under the premise they were going to show, and this is the weirdest thing, they were going to show the people that they could uh, use Dawn soap. Now, the weird thing about it is it was just Dawn soap and they could clean your carpet with Dawn soap, okay? Your whole carpet. And that was the way they were trying to get in, but they were very strange. I mean, even, even the people didn't know anything about black eyed children, they said these kids were strange. Yeah. And, and I think one did mention their eyes. Now, I, they didn't say they were black, they just said something was strange about their eyes. And, and they were very insistent that they needed to come in and show them about this. And they had a big bottle of Dawn soap. And it's like, are you kidding me? <laughs> and it was late. It wasn't like it was during the day. This was like, I think it was dark. It was, I think it was eight or nine o'clock at night. And they wanted to come in. They were very persistent. And they went around to the neighborhood and try to get, you know, get in the door or, or whatever. Nobody I'm aware of in this case allowed them to come in. So when I saw this, I went ahead and I started contacting some of these people that had these experiences. Unfortunately, when I even slightly got a little on the paranormal side, they shut down completely. They didn't want to hear about, you know, maybe this was something strange. I didn't really go into the black eyed children. I just wanted to see if I could continue a communication, which didn't work at all. But I really believe this was a black eyed children incident. Um, but uh, as far as I know, that was kind of the end of it. It lasted for a week or two, and there was probably five or six people said, yeah, we had the same visitation. It was kind of creepy. We told them to leave, and then sometimes they just seemed to vanish, or they, they said they just left quickly, or you know, we didn't see them where they went or something like that. So it just added on to my feelings that this was Black Eyed Children type incident. And we talked about this uh, yesterday. It seems like th these kids didn't come to our house. Right. And it seems like they won't go to people's homes who are aware of them. People who kind of have, or in the genre we are, in the paranormal, it seems like they know because I'll, you know, I will protect my family and my animals and I will beat their butts. I don't want them coming near the house. They know that. So I, I think that they always go to people who are innocent, who just don't know about them. Um, and, it, and, and, but it has happened even, and crazy enough, even on bases where, where right, um, right. that's right. And that there's, and, I'm, and as Michael said, the Black Eyed Children written by David Weatherly, get it because it's a phenomenal book. I was enthralled with this book and I couldn't put it down. And he has a lot of different stories. If you wanna know the different um, people who these children have targeted, it's even people in the military, which is I think crazy because those are the guys that you know could really defend themselves. But the one thing they always say is that they get this horrific feeling inside of dread. Right. It's just this horrible feeling like, like the Grim Reaper is in front of you and, and, is, and you know that you're going to die or that is, and they get into your mind. So they do a little bit of the, that, uh, that psychic mind play where they just go in and they will, some people will say they have, they were out of control they had no control of their faculties and they were actually going to open the door, but 
but one lady said her cat made a hissing and, and screaming sound and it kind of got her out yeah. of the trance. And so they put people in trances to get them to open the door. Now, what's really scary about the black eyed children is that they will continue to keep on knocking and they'll even knock on the windows and they know if you're on the other side of the door. Yeah, yeah. Which makes it really creepy. Well, it's, beyond, <laughs> it's basically beyond black. creepy. But going back to the one on the military base, you, you gotta think about this. This, this was in, I, if I remember the story kind of correctly, it was in one of these uh, barrack type uh, deals where they had a whole bunch of people. And, and anyways, think about this once. This is a military base and people or, or whatever do not just walk onto a military base and no. go into the barracks. No. Basically, there is guards, there's people watching, there's a perimeter, et cetera, et cetera. So just to think, so that would make you think that these things appear and, and they can go, either they can go through things they can go through things undetected and they can appear and disappear. And a lot of the stories are that they appear and they disappear and they don't seem to right. see them walking away, getting in a car, doing anything like that. Now, all the stories do vary. It isn't that they're 100% consistent, but there's many things that are consistent with them. Well, there's something that just came to my mind. Um, Michael and I are gonna do a MIB video down the line, but there was a story on Phantom and Monsters um, that's a wonderful website um, where actually, um, uh, uh, I don't remember if it was a, I think it was a lady, saw the kids walk down the street and get into a black car. And there were adults waiting for them that looked like the men in black. So there could be that, that connection right. to, to the MIBs. Um, there could be a connection to just really dark, shady entities that um, you know, some people connect them to something demonic. I think they're more dreg like D R E G G. And because uh, they're, they're not, dregs aren't demons, they're just basically something that is, just doesn't have our best interest at heart. But uh, anyway, so that is that connection that, that um, I think you were thinking about with the MIBs. Right. But I think these these guys are a little bit different. And, and I think I think one of the other things is to me, they also have this vampire feeling to them oh, yeah. that they have this sucking energy yeah. suckers. They'll actually they're they're there and they're trying to create maybe some fear. They're trying to create something and they're trying to draw that out. I don't know what it means precisely for them to get inside. You know, are they going to. You know, are they going to do something worse or, or are they going to try to kill somebody? Well, they always somebody? Leave, I don't really know. But they leave. They, they typically leave, right? Yeah. And the people don't have any memory of what happened. Right. So, they're right. Like, so there, I think there's some type of energy sucking creature. Energy entity, vampire. Right. Yeah. Energy va vampire. And uh, and we can talk about that in the future also. We have our own energy we have, vampire. We, we have our own story. <laughs> story that we have to be very careful when we tell you to yeah. you because it's pretty crazy. So let me start off uh, this next part with just reading two paragraphs of the article that I submitted to Paranormal Underground. Okay, go ahead. And this is gonna start off with the Slender Man um, phenomenon. So um, I started off by saying, many spooked out people have talked about seeing shadow men who are wearing top hats or weeping ghosts that resemble a woman searching for her lost child. It's part of the human experience to see a ghostly resemblance of what once existed, man, woman, or child. Glimpses of painful losses or intimidating encounters extend into the hereafter. Why is this? Is there gender dissim dissimilarity within the ethereal world? What if something was none of the above, a being yet to be discovered? Are there other ghostly apparitions spied upon other than that of a man or woman? There are many accounts of children haunting, hauntings but then most people will usually see a specific gender that they can relate to. A crying child in many instances can give the worst chills based on the unthinkable demise or circumstance and the menacing entity that ensnares the unsuspecting human through an innocent guise. But what is it that makes us think of something being male or female? And that was basically a part of my, my article is that why do we identify with a man, a, 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 an, the profile of a man or a woman or the the apparition of a child and is it necessary in the afterlife i mean are do these things understand that that's how we identify our reality with either you're a man or you're a woman or you're a child or you're you know you're a pet 
or something like that. But the interesting thing about the Slender Man is he's featureless. So what does right. that mean? What made him a part of our reality, what, 15 to 20 years ago? Mm -hmm. And as huge as he is, he's extremely tall, he actually affects uh, teenagers, it, mm -hmm. tweeny boppers or something. So it just doesn't, it doesn't seem like it, he necessarily is something that is brought to adults, um, to their mindset. But obviously this was created by, I think, um, some games that, uh, right. that kids played. Sure. But then somehow it became something that took on its own life form. But I just find it so interesting is that it does look like a guy, but there's no feature. So it's, what does that mean? Right. I think it actually, it's right. It has, it has the feel that it's, it's a male, it's a male energy, right? Mm -hmm. And it's it maybe being tall somewhat and being maybe, I don't know, slender wouldn't have anything to do with it, but I think it also wears a hat of some sort. Some he's a tall, he's, he's like a 12 feet tall, slender. He looks like uh, the circus guys who are on stilts. He has right. that look with really long arms and he's got a hat on. And um, he just, he, he's just like right. nothing in the face whatsoever. Right. But yeah. you can actually, but he, his features are, uh, you know, he has hands, he has arms, he has legs. So it's just like this phenomenon that happened that would kind of was like, I, I call it like the Franken, like the Frankenstein phenomenon where we can actually create our own monsters. Right. Right. It's, so. it's a mind, mind creation. Yeah. And I think maybe that this is what happened because of this game situation and these people that played it were young people, tweens, and, mm -hmm. and they have it in their mind. And so since the mind can create things, it actually created it on the outside. And it is very real, I believe. It's a very real phenomenon. Uh, but the question will be, will it would affect adults that know nothing about the game that I don't think we can answer right now. Right. And, and the, the sad thing about it is, is uh, the, actually what happened with the, the three gals, the two gals that actually stabbed their friend um, based on what they thought Slender Man had told them. And I, I think that um, if we look at this, can it be that there was another energy source, some entity that was just waiting to be able to come into our reality and it just jumped right into the Slender Man image mm -hmm. and started taking advantage of young adults or right. you know, 20 boppers and teenagers. Right. Right. So I often wonder about that. I mean, really, is, is, is it something else that's just took off on this image and just decided that this image would be the way that it would get into the minds of children? Yeah, and, and, and this really goes back to my uh, uh, kind of uh, research I did when, when I was talking about uh, aliens, et cetera. A lot of times an alien type energy, what they will do is basically scream. They know it's in your mind mm -hmm. and they will actually use that as a screening so that you feel com a little more comfortable with it. Instead of, you know, one of the examples would be owls. They love to screen themselves as owls or deer. They love to screen yourself as deer or whatever was in your mind previous. Because I, I would talk to a lot of uh, people that had, you know, alien type encounters and they would say, oh, well, I was little and I was watching a program, a cartoon or something. And on the cartoon was these wolves or was this, that and the other. And all of a sudden they looked outside, they heard some noise out there, they looked outside and right away there was exactly what was on the TV, but outside now. Mm -hmm. And what it really was in my, I believe, is that was some gray aliens or some type of alien entities that were actually screening himself or making himself look like whatever was in their mind to make them feel comfortable with the situation. Yeah, it has to be make a the humans feel, image. Right, make, make the humans feel comfortable because they were probably reading their mind and saying, oh, well, this person or this kid was feeling comfortable and happy with the vision of a cartoon character. And they, you know, all of a sudden made themselves look into that. And that's happened many times mm -hmm. in, the, in the hundreds of interviews I've done, I've had, it comes up over and over again at this screening type thing. And this could very well be the same similar type of energy and, and that Rainbow is talking about with the slender man here. So yeah, who knows? Right. So, I mean, 
for me, it's like when, when we're looking at all of this strange stuff with the paranormal, I mean, my question is, is when people see a demon, do they say, see a female or a male demon? And, and the, the question is, do we really care? Because it's, it's terrifying. It's still a demon. It, yeah. So why do we, I mean, I don't, I've never said any, heard anybody say that a demon was more male versus female. I think people tend to think it's more male. Um, but I, I often wonder why we even have to put that onto something that is obviously not necessarily from here. I mean, how we identify with it, because I believe that outside this reality, there's no time. Time doesn't exist. And so if time doesn't exist, I don't think gender matters. Right. So, uh, but when it comes to scary stuff, it just seems like in horror flicks that what we do is we tend to identify with it being male or female. And females are just as scary as males um, in horror flicks. Um, in fact, probably more so because especially as vampires. I mean, they, they, I don't know why, but females scare me more than males <laughs> as vampires. It doesn't make any sense, but it, 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 they just do. Right. And, and then of course there's the other one that is succubus incubus situation. That's yes. a whole nother topic. We could probably Yeah. Talk one about. is for a guy and one is it's for really a girl, but why, right. or what if it's the same thing that's changing its image a little bit right, right. to work with the male or female and, energy. And, and again, incubus, succubus, it really just ends your sucker. So they, they basically would go in and yes. suck energy. And, oh, and like yeah. I say, we could, well, we can do another whole uh, session on, on incubus and succubus, because again, it's an example that yeah. we're talking about. Yeah. But, but then again, why does it, I, I think through the history, of all these these different types of creatures that it, it just seems like there has to be this this um, kind of gender stamped onto whatever it is. And I, I often question that because I know religion does that as well. And I just I just think that when something's coming in from a Ouija board in particular, um, that these things are just kind of waiting on the other side of a Ouija board. And they're just basically just ready to come through when somebody opens up that portal. Right. But I don't think that that thing that's coming through is worried about itself being male or female. It's just that these things are very empathic and, and they're, they have this ability to get into the minds of, of their, their victims. And so they know that we dent as human beings, we identify with male and female type of energy. So that's where they come through showing more male or more female. And that's why I think they target people because I think people who are more empathic and psychic who are more open are the ones who get targeted first. That's just my But at the opinion. same time, Rainbow, they should really be those people that you're talking about, including ourselves, we should be more prepared because we understand the possibility. We are, you and I are prepared. Right. But they, they've gotten but by some go of our defenses, through. though. They've gotten by right. our defenses. But, but you know what, though? You have to have those experiences to, learn, to allow yourself room to learn and then protect yourself. Because right. I, I mean, I remember when I was studying to be a medicine woman in my early 20s that you know, Thunderbow and Ruben and Anna. And all these people that I studied with and V, they would tell me all kinds of things. But until I actually experienced it by my, you know, with my personal experience on my path, I didn't get it. And sometimes it was, you know, I was face plant, planted on the ground because I didn't learn what they had tried to tell me. But eventually, as you go through life, you learn to protect yourself. Right. So I can tell, and that's why it's so hard as a young adult to hear someone older than you tell you be careful of this or that because you're like oh because you're invincible that's well, just the well, way I'm people not. are i'm not but when i was younger i think we all thought we were invincible oh i can handle this right. whatever no, but then you learn the hard way that right. you can't and then you learn to protect yourself yeah. so i but i i know that in the different experiences i've had dealing with very dark dark um, entities that I realized right off the bat, I could always decide that what's my battle, what's not my battle. Mm -hmm. I could figure out, do I want to fight this or not? And I think people have to realize too, that they can always back away from something that you, it's not always your fight. 
And uh, that, that I learned early on. But when it comes to stuff like this, that actually is, is out there, I mean, what do people do to protect themselves? Well, I mean, we can just, I, I can just talk about what we do. We, we've yeah. always smudged ourselves. We make sure that we go out, we go out to when we're at the Skinwalker Ranch, or if we go out to cemeteries or we go to other places, we basically smudge ourselves, say a little bit of a prayer. Uh, or, but or, let me ask you something. Yes. Uh, but the smudging didn't really help much uh, at the Skinwalker Ranch, so right right and sometimes you're right you don't really quite know what what will fit the situation but you can only do it what you know until you find out it didn't work and then you got to re you revisit it because if we go to when we go back to skinwalker ranch we're going to probably have to figure out something completely oh different you bet because that was a uh, pretty amazing experience when you yeah. went there and came back and, well they followed us home right there right so that that's basically uh in one of the last videos that i did when the paranormal follows you home what do you do Right. And then these things, when they're attracted to you, what do you do right. when you're dealing with an energy vampire or some kind of a weird phenomenon out there? Like we've been out um, in in the forests and looking for Sasquatch or Dogman, um, trying to get contact with them. But I think that there have been other things in the forest that we attracted to us. Right. I, you know, and one of the things I always, you know, all these years people have asked, asked advice of me uh, when they had alien encounters or, or abduction experiences, et cetera, et cetera, and they have an encounter with an entity of some sort that seems to want to hurt them. Basically, I tell them is fear is going to be the your worst thing oh, yeah. because that's what many of them are looking, not all of them, but many of them are looking for you to have fear because they live off of that fear. That sure. whole fear thing is, is a big deal. So you got to stop that. It's tough, but you got to say, no, I'm not fearful at all. You know, and, and you start telling them what you want them to do. Because basically, in all my experiences have been, and my ones that were, could have been very scary, I just said, I just went for it. I just told them, back off, go away. I don't want you here. You know, what, whatever it is, just tell them to leave. And a lot of times that seems to work. Not always, but a lot of time testing, you really need to try that as your number one, your number one step to try to get rid of those entities. And many times they will. Uh, but they're looking for you to be fearful. They're looking for you to, to look fearful so they can suck more of your fear energy. Mm -hmm. And if you more fear, the more fear you create, the more energy they love you, it. You, they love it because <laughs> it, it makes them bigger. You don't want to make them bigger, you want to make yourself bigger. You want to make them small so you can stay ahead of that so well and, and it's you have to understand when it you you it's it's time to stand your ground right and when it's not i mean because i don't think there's anything in walking away from something that could be uh scary something that could actually um be detrimental to your well-being i think you have to understand when to walk away but i don't think walking away in fear is is the way to do it and i think actually i'm glad you brought that up um, because the biggest beef, <laughs> I, I, in the last video I did, I said I had the beef or whatever, is all these reality shows, and I like them. I, I watch a lot of reality shows on YouTube, but I don't like it when they, they go into places and then they get some kind of contact and they scream and they run. Right. And so that's what our, our reality is right now with a bunch of people who want to be entertained because we're all kind of stuck at home. And so they, they watch all these shows and these, these people get a lot of subscribers and they get a lot of you know, ratings and that's great, but that's not reality because you, you don't go out looking for trouble and then run because not in every case can you run. No, these true. things won't always let you run and there's something that's going to figure out that you're going to run because if they're if you're dealing with the paranormal then to me the paranormal is already figured out the human consciousness mm -hmm. it gets us before well, well e even that even if you run basically there's a lot of them have the, the capability of hooking on to you and coming sure. back home with you like we've talked about yeah so you got to realize that too you're just getting running out of the woods and jumping in your car and driving home, that doesn't necessarily 
end that conversation. Oh, it, it does it. And in yeah. some cases, in some cases it would, depends on what it is. Well, but it's I, another human, then yeah. Well, it's another <laughs> human, well, yeah. But, or maybe even a Sasquatch or a dogman, they probably won't end up in your in your house with you. No. Uh, but other entities that are, have other ways of, of hooking onto you or getting on you or kind of like leeching onto you, they will come home and we, we've experienced that. And it's not, it's not necessarily pleasant. You know, Rainbow basically got us out of it, uh, but we spent, how long do you think we, we had much, issues much with it? In, in Salt Lake City, you know, the one after Skinwalker Ranch. Well, um, how long is that, a week, a whole week of uh, that? Or? Yeah, it was a couple of weeks. A couple of weeks. So we had yeah. experiences a couple of weeks. And, yeah. and I think finally Rainbow just said enough is enough and basically told them to hit the, hit the trail. At first, I think we were just, it was kind of some, I don't want to say fun, but it was that kind of like for me. <laughs> okay, but it was kind of <laughs> just, kind of seeing what was going to be next. I mean, they didn't do anything. Oh terrible, well, it was terrible. only Antioch, the the gin that right the gin the gin the yeah. gin he 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 uh, he just wanted to be heard, and and I think with with that experience, uh, one thing that I learned is that uh, I am queen in my home. Michael is king in our home and the queen and, the queen always wins so if the king doesn't win it's always the queen so just so uh, you know that but it, i no one else rules this house outside of michael and me i do not allow anything in my home i will fight to the end to get rid of whatever's in my home and i think when entities and in, in beings know this that they'll leave um, right. I, that's just my feeling, and, and there may be pe people out there who think I'm I'm off my rocker, and you know Michael might agree with them, <laughs> but I think that that true to what I've experienced in my life that when I put my foot down, when I drew the line in the sand, and when I stood my ground and I said get the hell out of here, they laugh because I have a lot of of entities and angels and beings and spirit guides that protect me and, and help me out. Plus, I have my my uh, my lineage, my family who passed away, who protect me. So you don't want to mess with my mom or my grandma. So they will they will get you. So I know that I have that protection. And and I think something else What's that? is you have to know without a shadow of a doubt. I, I'm not gonna not believe, but know that you can get rid of them. Because if you believe with fear, they'll never leave. That's right. They won't. That's absolutely true. They won't. Yeah, you really have to have that very positive, straightforward, pushing attitude that you're getting and get out of here. You're absolutely right. going to get out of here. And there's been times when I told people that they were they had a shadow person that was in their house. I remember one story. This was uh, oh, in Albuquerque. Count. Well, this this person, um, I actually uh, met this person on, on a flight in and out of Albuquerque. And she was telling me a story where she had a shadow person and she would see this person at the corner of her eye. And it, and it basically at first seemed to be just kind of there, you know, and they have a tendency to go in, they'll be in the house or they'll always be in this house, even if, you know, different people, uh, the owners change hands and they were kind of there to kind of protect the house, et cetera. And that's what she thought at first. Then it seemed to be getting a little weirder and more strange. And she basically didn't know what to do. And she said, listen, what, what can I do? And I said, listen, you just have an opportunity, go face it and just tell please time has come you have to leave now and i'll be sending a gun she sent me an email a couple of weeks later and says you know what i did that and the entity is gone and i didn't i said if you ever if it ever comes back let me know i never heard anything from the woman but uh you know i think it worked and there's been other people i've told that especially with the abductions where i tell them to, to tell them to stop abducting you. And, and that also worked, not always, but it, many times it did, so right. anyways. Yeah, well, I in, in adding to that, um, as far as what to do when something follows you, I had a really scary experience when Michael and I, uh, this was last year, went out um, and we're trying to, I was trying to find Warja again um, the female Sasquatch that I got in contact with. And I think she and her her um, clan. clan had moved to another part of, of the Hood, um, uh, Hood Mountain. Uh, Hood National Forest. Yeah, yes. Mount um, Hood and National Forest. Mount, Mount Hood. And so um, 
I had a brain fart there, sorry. But what happened was we had come home and um, probably about two days after we had come home, I woke up paralyzed completely and I could look all around our room. Um, Michael was sleeping next to me and I had electricity sound, a sound of electricity in my right ear. And this tall, this, well, it was a, a like a tree trunk, dark gray, brown, black tree trunk. And it looked like a, a tree trunk was in our, our bedroom and it was right next to me and it was talking to me, but I think that it was frequency. And I felt like, have you ever gone underneath the um, electric lines? Our high power yeah. tension lines, and, yeah. And that sound that, yeah, yeah, it was in my ear and my ear was really hot, but I couldn't move and I'm freaking out. And I'm, I, and I was trying to call Michael. And what was scary is that this thing didn't wake up the animals. And um, Beastie, oh, I call him Beastie, it's Beepo. He has his own little chair. And so he was asleep, the dog was asleep. Nobody was awake, just me. And I don't know what this thing was trying to say to me or what it was trying to do. I thought at first it might be something demonic. I was, it, cause it, it just, when something paralyzes me, I don't like that. So finally I got the words out, Michael, I couldn't hardly talk. And then this thing just released me and disappeared. And I sat up in bed and Michael's, I, I called out for Michael and he woke up and he asked me what was wrong. And I said, I think something was in the room. And he said, are you okay? And I said, yeah. And then we were both real sleepy. So I went back to bed. Well, I just recently, uh, about two weeks ago, three weeks ago, had a Reiki treatment in New Mexico. And I asked about this particular entity uh, to um, Anna, who's my mentor, she's a Reiki master. And I, and when she was doing, um, when we were ha having the session done on me, she told me that this was an elemental. She said that, and he was from, um, she said that she sees a spacecraft and that he had seen us and that he felt he could communicate with me. And so while we were out looking for Sasquatch or I was trying to find Morja, this elemental found me. And she said that he's, he is, um, he's lives out there, but he also, had, it, he goes up on a spacecraft and, you know, I don't care if people think that's nuts. It seemed to make sense to me because I knew he was speaking a language to me, but I couldn't understand it. And so she said, just, you know, connect with him and just see what more he says, see if he can maybe switch it around to, you know, speaking in, in my language, which is, you know, obviously bad English, but, uh, and I think that I'm going to try to do that to connect with him, but that's what can happen when you go out looking in the paranormal, you'll go looking for something and something else spots, despise you, and then they want to contact you. So when people go into haunted houses or they go into haunted locations, um, you'll never know what is looking at you. You just don't know. Right. And I, and I think that's that's what happens when you're, you're out there looking, you yeah. open your you open yourself up. That's a little that's a little good. And it's a little bit bad. It's sort of like to some degree, like the Ouija board situation. Which oh, yeah. We don't we, we don't believe I don't. Anyways, I, I believe Rainbow believes the same. Ouija boards are really dangerous, especially, to the, especially to the amateurs, because it is a vehicle in which people open their minds up way too much. And they don't understand that really some stuff is going to come through. And many times it does. And it can really mess up people. I mean, I when I lived in Arizona, somebody worked for me, that particular person, uh, they were doing a Ouija board situation. And they sat around and they were doing their thing, having a good time, drinking and carrying on. And what happened is uh, his wife, his this particular person's wife, really got into it. And there was an entity that came out. And it took her weeks. She could not. She was basically lost her freaking mind. And she was just doing all kinds of bizarre stuff. He called me up and said, listen, Mike, I don't know what's going on. I said, you didn't use a Ouija board, did you? He said, yeah, we did. I said, please. So what I told there was two things we, he, she did. Now, this, he, she, let, me, let me explain. It was like the third day after this Ouija board. She seemed to be fine. And suddenly she just kind of went off. And she didn't. She was very confused. She did this, that, and the other. And I can't remember exactly uh, two things I, I know I did tell her. I told her to go ahead and eat. There was 
three or four different foods or something that it was, it was some, some natural stuff. And then I said, take your shoes off, go outside, sit and bury your feet as deep as you can in the earth. And with, within hours of that experience, eating and drinking some food and digging their feet into the ground, her feet into the ground, she was fine. Because she basically had regrounded herself into Mother Earth. And that seems to work. That seems to work in her particular case. I was hoping it would. If it didn't, I wasn't really too sure what to go with it. But uh, it was pretty, pretty scary for him. Uh, he didn't seem to have any uh, repercussions, but she definitely did. So I think they, uh, I think they told her, told them to go ahead and take the Ouija board and bury it. Some people burn them. I don't think burning is really good, but I think burying is better. I think, I've known I people think, who have buried Ouija boards and the Ouija board ended up back in their house. Oh, well, anyways, uh, I, I don't so. remember if I told the burner or you know, some people say burning is bury, bad. Bury is bury. better, always better. Okay, well, bury is better. Good, I did the right thing then. But anyways, they, did, they didn't have any other problems uh, after that and I, they didn't want to even go there anymore. In fact, they, they just didn't want to even talk about it with me. <laughs> they didn't want to be your friend anymore. <laughs> well, no, they were already being a friend. I never told them to use a Ouija board. If they would have asked me to use what you, and we want to use a Ouija board, I'd say absolutely not. I tell everybody no. no I mean, because everybody's that. an amateur. Right. I, even I'm an amateur. Here's the thing is that I, I, I don't even have to use a Ouija board. We don't have to use Ouija boards no. to have the paranormal come to us. Nobody needs it. Yeah, it's, yeah. And it's not a game. And that's what, what I think is really important to tell people is it's not a game. Right. I mean, I had a friend of mine um, who was, she was a, a student, a really good dancer. And she said, you know, I've had some paranormal stuff happening in my house. Will you come and check it out? She said, I don't know what's going on. And so she had a, her, her young son and she said, you know, he seems to be uh, having problems at school. He's not doing as well. And I think something's happened. And I said, well, what, what did you guys do? And she said, well, we kind of, you know, he wanted a Ouija board. I let him have it. I said, did, did he start playing with it? And she said, yes. And I said, oh my God. And so, um, so I went to the house and I looked all around and there was a dark entity in the apartment. And, and the one thing that I always tell people, I can't get rid of an entity if the person who's living in the home doesn't want to get rid of it because it's not my choice. That's right. It's, it's up to the person who's living there, if they can live with it or not. And she didn't have a problem with the entity, but I told her, I said, you need to get that Ouija board out of the house. I said, because you don't know if that entity is talking to your son. You don't know what it's telling him. He, you know, he's having problems right now. And that's probably because entity is talking to him. I said, so the one thing you want to do is you want to get rid of the Ouija board because she didn't think there was a problem with it. And I have a different opinion when it comes to Ouija boards, only because I've had to deal with people with Ouija boards for uh, years. I don't think that you have to actually go back into the Ouija board and then re-end the session. Yeah, close it because, right. because it's already a done deal. The, the entity is already out of the bag. Uh -huh. He's, he's going to stay or she's going to stay. We, we, we want to put a male or female gender to them. So that's not the key. The key is to get rid of the portal. So you right. want to get rid of the portal so that nobody else is going to use it. Um, and then you do ceremony in your home and you dictate to the entity or whatever it is, the rules of the household. And you just say, number one, you don't ever talk to my son. Number two, you don't ever talk to me. Number three, out the door. You're not welcome. Whatever. If somebody doesn't have a problem, it's just there's nothing you can do about it. I told her she had to dictate the rules of the house because she was the mistress of her home. And, you know, I, I didn't hear that anything bad had happened after that, but I was the one who actually took the Ouija board and we, we got rid of it. But I do believe that if a family is dealing with something like a Ouija board, I think that the whole family, whether they're the people who originally did the opening, the family can close it. There, and I think that's just ridiculous to think that once something's open, that it can't be closed. Um, I just think that it depends on the circumstance. If an entity is out and the people don't want to do, they don't want to do with the Ouija board, fine. It's out. You got to figure out what to do with it. Mm -hmm. But if a family, they, they have it and they're willing to go back in, you know, everybody in that family can intend 
what they want that entity to do. And you just have to, to go, if you go back and use that Ouija board, you tell the entity, if it's in your home, exactly where he's gonna go, where she's gonna go back into the ethereal world where they came from, they are not welcome. And if you do it with intent and knowing with no fear, like you were saying, you can't, you can't state something in fear, they won't, listen, they don't have to, they know it. And the more fear you have, the more stronger and powerful they get. So they don't have to worry about anything. Mm -hmm. But when you have a whole family and a group of people who are pissed off, mad and angry and want, want it out, it's going to go. And, and I know this because I've seen it happen. So I, I don't understand why people want to live in fear. It just doesn't make any sense to me. You can get rid of this stuff, but don't play with Ouija boards, please. It's, no, it's, ab yeah. absolutely not. I mean, I, I think, you know, there, there's been, and I don't remember the name of the book, but there was a famous book about the Ouija boards and talk, discuss some of the similar things we talked about. Now, there's been you know, the military actually got involved with Ouija boards and um, there were some famous cases of them. And I, I met one of the guys, uh, I think the brother, his brother was actually part of this group in Alabama that at, on a military base, uh, I think it was uh, Fort Benning, I guess. Yes, there was a group of them that got together, they're intelligence guys, and they got together and they started using the Ouija board to find out some really almost like remote viewing. Mm -hmm. They used the Ouija board to do that. Then they it got a little out of hand and got it crazy again. And apparently they all went to a, what is it? Uh, AWOL. AWOL. And they, uh, they were tracked down by the military police uh, and they were all over the country with some really strange stuff. I wish I remember the name of the book, but it was an incredible book. But I, the only reason I knew about this was that the, the guy uh, I had befriended one of the brothers of one of the guys that were actually in the middle of this, and he, he told some pretty amazing stories. And again, we could probably do a whole session on that. But again, it's the Ouija board. You know, I know some people play with them and they don't seem to have any issues, but there's a lot of issues out there. And, and anything that will open up a portal that you can actually create a portal, and it's really your mind more or less doing it, can be very dangerous, uh, especially to the real amateurs. I think the world, our people out there, Rainbow, I'm sure you've known some that could handle the Ouija board and handle it properly because they've been in this, this uh, world uh, of this, the entity type world or the alien type world that have been involved with this. Well, years. medicine men and women, medicine, I think are the perfect right, examples. Exactly. You, you, they would deal with it. If they talking about to. people who, um, who are, have studied the Ouija board and who get it and who, who know what it's all about. That's, that's a different story. You're talking about people who are knowledgeable. Right. And who, who know about what what can happen and who know what to do if something does happen. Exactly. A lot of people just open up the Ouija board and they, they have these portals open and then they they don't know what they're doing. And then all of a sudden you have problems. And I always wonder, and this is just my my feelings on it, is that there's responsibility that we have in allowing another entity into this reality because I'll guarantee you that maybe one family may have gotten rid of that entity out of their home, right. but where does that entity go? Right. Once it's here, it's gonna go bother somebody else. Right. And so everybody has else. that responsibility right. when they play around with this stuff. Because I know that people who take Ouija boards and go into hauntings, they go into haunted homes with Ouija boards to find out who's haunting the house and they create more of a problem. Sure, sure, they open it up and God only knows what else is going to come floating sure. through there. And it may have nothing to do with the original one. You've just added more, more crazy to the, the house. And it really, you really shouldn't. It's, it's a tough thing. So, yeah. So, so what do you think? Well, and the last thing I want to talk about is something that I'm not quite sure where it came from, but I've been hearing a lot of stories about it. And it's, it's the, um, I think they're called the rakes. They're like white. Now they're not like with the Stargate SG-1, the Wraith, or whatever it is, uh, where they're like these vampire, scary looking entities that kill people or whatever. Um, I haven't seen the show in a long time, so I don't remember which, which program it was on. But, um, but these things are white and they um, have hollow eyes and um, they walk funny and they make screeching sounds and they, they actually can move really fast mm -hmm. and they tend to be in the forest areas 
And I know that there's places um, in, um, I think people who've been in Texas and people who have been down South. And uh, I think um, the mo most of the, the stories I've heard of are from down South or from the Texas area. Right, and here's an, I'll tell you an interesting story. Talk about Texas. I just, I just remembered <laughs> this crazy story yeah. that I, I, I worked work with somebody um, and I think it was in Albuquerque. Anyways, uh, he he lived in uh, the southern part, of, just in Houston, the Houston area. And they had a hurricane there. And I remember this probably at least 15, 20 years ago. They had a hurricane and it knocked over some big, big trees. And these, he, they never had him and his wife, I think they had a little child, had never had any kind of issues or problems. But when these trees fell over, uh, I think his wife was Vietnamese and she kind of knew something was up. They were having some, some strange things happen around their house. And she finally told him, she was afraid to tell him, but she said, because these trees had tipped over, that there was entities underneath the trees that actually came out. And she did describe, interesting enough, I had forgotten all about mm -hmm. this. Rainbow just reminded me that she was describing the way these things looked. That's exactly what he told me these entities looked like that she, they believed or she she believed had come from underneath the ground because nature had been disrupted. It actually had the tree that come over big. It was a gigantic oak tree they had and it had tipped over. And the, these things were having some strain. And she he remembers seeing this white thing with these strange eyes that had come out and was kind of standing in their yard. And uh, eventually his wife told him the story from Vietnam, I think in Vietnam they had creatures like that. And you remember after a storm or something that disrupted nature, maybe it was a lot of thunder, lightning, wind, it was, that just disrupted everything. These creatures would seem to come out and cause havoc around the area they were. So anyways, go ahead. Wow, that just makes me wonder what's gonna happen for us. Yeah, right. We lost three trees from the ice storm that came by. Right, yeah, so, yeah, some, yeah. some crazy. I'm glad we don't have no big oak trees because they they have their yeah. own strangeness. Yeah, but our trees. English laurel that we lost, right? We lost little a fairy lot. tree. I don't think the fairies are very happy with that. No, no. But um, no. but anyways, as as far as those go, I just noticed that there's more and more stories of people seeing these these things, and I don't know if they're cryptid. So I I'm not quite sure what they are. I don't know if they're uh, elemental. I don't know if they're just a, a be another being that actually comes up. That's actually like you were saying, maybe something wherever it lived has been, you know, people moving, buying property and building homes and taking, yeah, taking away these trees, taking insurance. away their where they used they used to live, taking right. their their home away. Right. Uh, maybe that's why these things are more prevalent now, and and maybe that's what all this is really about. It's just. Um, when humans kind of just don't even think about any other other beings outside themselves when right. they they move into a place this is what happens yeah and, and i heard some stories up in washington state um, that uh, when there was some of those landslides uh, years ago and had all this rain up there and there was some of these landslides there was also some reported entities or something strange around these people's houses after the landslide. So there may be something going on uh, that's related to what yes. we're talking about with different disruptions or national uh, national disasters uh, around the country. So it's something to kind of keep in mind yeah. and keep it ear out and see what you hear, so, okay. Yeah, so that's just kind of the, the premise of the article that I had written. It was really kind of based on why it, and also is it a sign of the times when these these entities or creatures are kind of created in the mindset of human consciousness mm -hmm. is it a sign of the times because we've had some wackadoodle times in you know the last couple of years um, especially with people dealing with the pandemic sure and with all this other stuff so it just seems to me that people got a little darker in this last year or so from the pandemic because people were stuck home and so now all this, um, this, these shows are coming up where they people want to be scared silly in their own homes because sure. they can't go anywhere. Right. So I just uh, just wonder if the mindset of humanity creates a new creature every mm -hmm. so often because it 
kind of is, is an example of the times. Mm -hmm. What do you think? I definitely think so. I mean, you know, I've always believed in the, the whole deal that these entities and creatures want to basically gin up, I guess, uh, these energy, all human energy, because they feed off of it. And I think pandemics, you know, political uh, upheavals, uh, just disasters, everything that builds civil the human, unrest. <laughs> yeah, civil unrest, everything that gets everybody's anxiety up yeah. and creates this energy. This is what they want. They want this extra energy that's out there with it's all food. these, it's food to them. So I think that's something to be aware of. Uh, hopefully they, they have enough food for a while and they can let us alone. Uh, but I, I think there's something in the mix there. I really, really do. Yeah, I think that's what this, um, this, this article was about. I think I ended it with a, um, something that um, a Native American chief, is, his name is Seattle, Chief Seattle. And um, he stated so well was there was no death, only a change in worlds. And, you know, I ended with this, this article saying as one door closes, another one opens, it just depends on if we open and close the door ourselves. So I think what's important is to understand that we have to be responsible when it comes to the paranormal. Um, there are things out there. Um, there are new things out there that we're not quite sure what they are. Um, even as paranormal researchers, we understand that we have to be extremely careful. Um, you know, so, and I think it's important to, to have someone always have two people together and have somebody grounded. Because Michael's my ground. Um, because sometimes if I, I get this impression or I feel something's around, I'm not, I, there's no, I'm almost kind of feel like I'm lifted off the ground because I, I, get the impression of whatever it is and so there's just no way i can be grounded there's no way i can actually even have an awareness of my surroundings michael has to be my eyes and my ears so if if people are going to go out there and do this i highly suggest that you never go alone and you take it serious that you have somebody who's your ground you have someone who's your eyes and ears and, and i always i watch his back he watches my back and um, you know, we hope that what we can do in, in the future is actually these different beings and entities that are out there, if we can go and find out who, what they are and, and where they came from and get evidence, and that's kind of what we want to do. Sure, sure. Okay, well, I think we, uh, I think we had some good stuff to yeah. discuss. Yeah. And uh... Anybody has any stories that you want to share, um, please uh, send them to us or write write about them in the comments below. We would love to hear anybody's story. Yes, and we share we, them. Yeah, and we would, you know, with your permission, of course, we'd read the stories. If you want us just to change the names, that would be great. And you can send them to our email, which is dimensionalwalking at gmail.com. Dimensionalwalking at gmail.com. Or you can leave some comments if you like. Please subscribe. We need our subscribers. We're new. We really, <laughs> really need that. And anyways, uh, that's it. Yeah. What do you think, Rainbow? Think Anything that's else? It. No, I think that's good. Thank you, everybody, for being willing to listen to our conversation today. Um, Michael and I just, this is kind of what we do. We talk about stuff like this. And we thought, well, hey, why don't we just do it in front of you guys and see what you think? So thanks okay. for joining us. Okay. Bye-bye. Be safe. Bye-bye.